Okay, collective yawn, who possibly wants to know about systems and processes? As human beings, we hate having people dictate to us that we need to do things a certain way. As human beings, we cherish our freedoms, our ingenuity, and our creativity. So why all this talk about systems and processes at all? What does that have to do with building our financial intelligence? I'll be honest with you, as boring as these things may seem, you know, systems and processes, they bring integrity to the very information upon which you will be making decisions. So you might think of this notion of bureaucracy as a necessary evil. However, in the absence of systems and controls and processes, there will be chaos and fake information. In the long run, you want to advocate for systems and processes as they are going to make your life easier. It will help you ensure that all assets are tracked and that they are protected. When we safeguard an asset, we mean protect it from someone walking away with it or that it gets misplaced or lost. Financial statements are created by summarizing all of the activities that happen in your organization over a period, usually a month, but it could be a quarter or a year. So for instance, if you sell products or you pay employees or buy inventory, all of these activities have a home on a set of financial statements. The type of transaction will dictate where it belongs. So for example, using your accounting process for when you sell a product, you will have a revenue process that will capture the activity, including receiving the sales order, filling it, billing it, and then collecting the money from your customer. Accounting systems and processes organize these like activities into similar buckets or what we call accounts. These accounts then get summarized onto a set of financial statements. The sales process is just one of many processes in your organization. Almost everything that happens in an organization is part of a process. And many, if not most, of these processes have tie-ins to your financial reports. One process that many non-financial people may be less familiar with is called the financial close process. Think of this process as the tail end of almost every other process in the organization. This process cleans up all sorts of transactions that don't get dealt with properly by the systems or the workaround processes in each of our functions. So the common things that get cleaned up in the financial close process would include things like trade spending amounts that are incurred but not yet paid or received, or expense amounts that have not been charged yet by a supplier, or shipments that have yet to be delivered or invoiced to a customer but have left the warehouse, or payroll amounts that aren't yet due but for which time or hours have been worked during a period. The output from the financial close process is the financial statements. Financial statements summarize and reinforce the most important stories of the business, only translated into a dollars and cents perspective. Everything you hear from management about how sales have gone, how operations have performed, uh, how growth projects are progressing, will all be captured in a set of financial statements. Finance is the most integrated function in any organization and touches all departments. There are three primary statements that you will be presented with. Let's review each of these quickly before we get into the details in later lessons. First of all, the income statement. The statement of earnings is often the most interesting statement for owners, executives, and directors. It's also a statement which is both understood on the surface and misunderstood in the details. The income statement tabulates your revenues during a period. Revenues may also be called sales. In Europe, most countries refer to revenue as turnover. Revenues are only recognized on that income statement when a product or service is delivered, regardless of when cash actually changes hands. Expenses are expenditures incurred to earn the associated revenues. Most of these expenses are what you would expect. You spend money, it becomes an expense. However, as you will learn, there is much more to it when it comes to how manufacturing costs and capital costs for plant and equipment get expensed on your statement of earnings. The key thing to remember with expenses is the idea that we want to capture and match all of the costs associated with the revenues that have been reported. 
You will use the statement of earnings to evaluate management's ability to manage the business, to achieve sales targets, to control spending, and to generate a bottom line return. Next, we have the balance sheet. And the first thing you're going to notice about the balance sheet is that it balances. It balances the book value of assets against how these assets have been financed using liabilities and shareholders' equity. An asset represents something that the business owns. A customer IOU, inventory, property, equipment, cash in the bank. These are all assets. Those are probably the most obvious types of what I'll call tangible assets. However, there's also a group of assets that we call intangible assets, such as patents, customer lists, trademarks, goodwill, prepaids, and deferred taxes that may show up as an asset on the balance sheet. Tangible generally means that we can see or touch the asset or there's a contract associated with it, whereas an intangible asset is something that has an economic benefit attributed to it, but it's not something you can just kind of pick up and walk away with. Liabilities on the other side of the balance sheet are monies owed to others. This would include amounts owed to suppliers, amounts owed to governments, amounts owed to banks, and amounts owed to other lenders. Sometimes there are liabilities for which an amount are not yet due, but have been incurred by virtue of what has already been reported on the income statement. For example, accrued liabilities are those that are reported as a liability, but for which there's no legal requirement yet to pay. So, say accrued payroll or accrued invoices. You may also see contingent liabilities, which are included because there is a likely or a high likelihood, but perhaps not a certainty, that an amount will have to be paid upon resolution of a particular matter. And finally, equity. Equity is the balancing account that summarizes largely three things. First of all, capital contributed by the owners. Second, capital withdrawn by the owners. And thirdly, the cumulative amount of income earned by the business over its entire lifetime. You will use the balance sheet to assess the financial strength of the organization. Financial strength means the ability to maintain operations and to invest in new projects. To evaluate financial strength, you generally want to see that an organization has cash or can access cash. You don't want to see too much debt. We will explore how you answer this question around financial strength in a later lesson. And finally, we have the cash flow statement. This statement gives you a clearer picture of the flow of funds in and out of the company's bank account. It is broken into three sections, as you can see by the slide here. Cash to, or from operating activities, summarizes how much cash the business has generated, or alternatively spent, during the period. You obviously want to see this as a positive number. Income reported on the income statement is not synonymous with cash generated from the business. The second section of the cash flow statement speaks to cash to or from investing activities. And this summarizes how the business has invested or divested in long-term assets. Assets like investments, properties, or equipment. And the, finally, the third section of the cash flow statement looks at the cash to or from financing activities and summarizes how the business was funded, either through debt issuances or equity contributions. Alternatively, if you're generating free cash flow, you are likely to be paying down loans or paying dividends uh, back to shareholders. And in this situation, these would show as negative cash outflows in this section of the cash flow statement. Now, the bottom line of the cash flow statement, the change in cash during a period, uh, and the absolute amount of cash at the end of the period, is not as interesting as you might think. And we're going to dive into this during a, a deeper dive in a later lesson. One last idea that you need to bear in mind as you read a set of financial statements, and that is one of accrual accounting. To close the books and produce a set of financial statements means to make an accurate cutoff. When you are reviewing an income statement for a particular period, say a month, you want to ensure that it only includes activity of that month. Accountants call this accrual accounting, which is another way of saying trying to match the activity, which includes the consumption and generation of assets, 
to the period in which such activity happens. So note that the money coming into and out of the bank account may provide an entirely different picture. Don't worry about that. And that's why you're also provided with that statement of cash flows. It's separate from the statement of earnings. A statement of earnings shows you how much accounting profit was earned in a period, whereas your cash flow statement shows you how much cash was collected or spent in that period. Before we do the deeper dive into the set of financial statements, we need to talk about the importance of internal controls and fraud prevention. And that's the topic of our next lesson. I'll see you there.